when affirmative action was white. As I was selecting the book for this project, I was hoping to find something that would increase my knowledge in an area that I have not ventured before. So I was considering selecting the book when affirmative action was white when it struck me with the thought of how and when was affirmative action ever white because I have been under the pressure of all these years that affirmative action was established for the blacks. This is when the challenge of diving into a territory that I have not traveled before begun. Let me begin by giving some information of where I was born and raised and the significance this book had on my life without me even knowing that it exists. I was born in the early 1970s in Birmingham, Alabama to young parents that had experienced personally or witnessed the treatment of blacks in one of the areas that is centered around this book. Birmingham was once coined the Magic City because of its overnight growth into the largest city in Alabama. It had the form of a renaissance city of the South that had the potential to be a major city of the South that could have offered sustainable lives for all races, but the ugly face of Jim Crow ceased any potential of equality amongst blacks and whites in the Birmingham and other southern cities during this time. Ira Katz Nelson provided some great knowledge and insight on how the white middle class forged their position on keeping blacks in a position far behind them during the 1930s and 1940s. His book gives some of the various tactics and political influence that whites used to create laws that made the lives of the majority of the blacks in the U.S. miserable and at some level meaningless. It was amazing to witness the key political figures manipulating the current laws to make sure that the economic disparity between blacks and whites in America would remain in place. The book begins with President Lyndon B. Johnson giving the commencement speech at Howard University, which is one of the oldest and celebrated historical black colleges and universities in June 1965. President Johnson utilized this moment to speak on various issues that exist in our society that hinder the progression of blacks in America. In his speech, he spoke of the unfair treatment of blacks in America due to the segregation and voting rights for blacks. As it was noted that segregation was forbidden the year earlier in July 1964 from this speech, but the treatment of blacks had not changed much in our society during these 12 months. Several major events had occurred prior to the president's speech at Howard, such as the voting rights movement in Selma, Alabama. After being successful with getting segregation forbidden, the leaders of the civil rights movement began to focus on getting voting rights for blacks put into law. On March 7, 1965, 600 people marched from Selma to Montgomery across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in protest of the voting rights for blacks. This day was known as Bloody Sunday. This demonstration convinced the federal government of the need for voting rights legislation. It is amazing in 1965, blacks still, not, still did not have the right to vote, being that the abolishment of slavery was put into place nearly 100 years earlier during the administration of Abraham Lincoln. President Johnson went before Congress to insist on a law to protect the rights to vote for all citizens, no matter race, color, or religion. The voter rights were the second peak for the civil rights movement. President Johnson made the statement to Congress where he identified the black struggle as his and as the country's own. With identifying that the black struggle was a problem for the country as a whole, there were 17 states that made it illegal for whites and blacks to step outside of the boundaries defined by the social order. In the South, racism was particularly brutal and pervasive south of the Mason-Dixon line. This form of racism was not only occurring in rural cities in the south, it was practiced in the progressive cities as well. During the post-Second World War, civil rights revolution began to take aim toward the attributes of Jim Crow and various codes that silenced the patterns of inequality. Many of these barriers to civil rights were eventually overcome.
The armed forces was desegregated after an executive order issued by President Harry Truman in 1948. During these times, a series of landmark decisions were made to reduce the presence of segregation, such as Brown v. Board of Education, the pass of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Open Housing Act of 1968. The Open Housing Act made it illegal for someone to be biased in regards to selling or the rental of housing due to an individual skin color. As we look at the welfare in black and white, we see the formation of the New Deal by President Franklin Roosevelt. Many wonder how could black Americans be anything but uncertain about the New Deal. One of the most influential black people during this time was W.E.B. Du Bois, which endorsed Franklin Roosevelt's re-election in 1944 despite his feelings of organized race hatred and segregation practice in the South. He believed that Franklin Roosevelt had done more for the uplift and progress of the Negro than any president since President Abraham Lincoln. Du Bois believed the advances, the advances in the economic and status of blacks offered by Franklin Roosevelt's program for economic recovery which helped small farmers mortgage assistance through the Federal Housing Authority and the recognition of the rights of labor to bargain for better wages and work conditions. We must not exclude the negative impact this deal had on black Americans as well. In the midst of providing some benefits to black Americans, the Franklin Roosevelt New Deal did not include the occupation in which black Americans worked and by organizing racist patterns of administration. The New Deal policies for Social Security, social welfare, and labor market restricted black pers perspectives while providing positive economic reinforcement for white citizens. During the Great Depression period, the women of the black race began to enter the workforce. The national norm during this time was, was for women to stay at home and out of the workforce, especially women with children. But it was recorded during this time Two out of five black women were working outside of the home. These women were working in some clerical positions, but most of the black women in the labor force were working in agriculture or in the domestic services. Most of the women working in domestic services were working in private homes. Even some of the poor white employed black maids during the, the Depression. The wages earned by this group of workers were the worst of any group and that they were the most exploited in the country. Black Americans who farmed in the South lived in some of the poorest conditions due to the minimum income they were able to generate. Living conditions were miserable for black farmers that, contribute, that contributed to many of the health issues that went untreated due to the lack of health care access. Black health reflected a dire state of poverty due to the fact that they could not afford doctor visits. Most Southern hospitals refused to admit African American patients, which led many African American patients to go untreated or be treated in black hospitals. In the South, blacks only had access to a limited number of teaching hospitals and segregated wings of voluntary hospitals. In these rural areas of the South, the number of doctors to patient ratio was very unbalanced. With minimum health care, blacks' death rate was much higher than whites. The life expectancy for black lagged you know, that of whites by 10 years between 1939 and 1941. The New Deal provided, for the first time, fairer access that blacks had experienced before. The federal government offered unemployment insurance, public assistance, and work relief. These progr programs provided funds and prospects where there had been little to none in the past. The Federal Relief Act started out providing adequate assistance to blacks, but eventually began to tailor relief to accommodate the demands of southern plantation owners. The combination of access to governmental support and powerful discrimination generated by local administration produced the racial differences in the size of grants to families in need. Being that this support was being administered by the local government in the South made it very difficult for the blacks to receive any sufficient help. The whites did everything to avoid any uniform treatment amongst blacks and whites in regards to receiving grants.
Southern states did not want any uniform treatment policies in place that would provide grants to individuals based on their living condition because blacks would have received more support than whites. The states had control over expenditures given by the federal government and the state had the authority over the relief agencies. The executive orders was issued by the governors or by the relief director he appointed. The legislature decided what money should be appropriated from the state resources. The federal government did not exercise its power by enforcing equal treatment.